officially back with season four, episode one, hitting it off with the bang. What does it mean to be a strength and conditioning coach? That's a loaded question, Corey, but I'm going to do my best to answer it. That's all we can do. Yeah. So there's a, it's actually an interesting conversation because in the early 2000s, there was a definitive, hey, should we reclassify as performance coaches? And, you know, the, I think the connotation or there was like a stigmatism associated with strength and conditioning coach that we were typecasting ourselves. We were limiting ourselves. We're perceived as maybe inadequate in regards to maybe sports medicine. So, and they kind of did the same thing too. Like athletic trainers wanted to be called more sports medicine. So there was this idea of what is the the name? It's almost like a rebrand, which though know, performance, I think mm -hmm. is like a, another element too, where we're so much more than that, right? We, you know, depending on what level you're at, the high school or non-power five or division three, division two, FCS, maybe even some like minor league systems, like you are wearing a lot of hats and performance is obviously your, it becomes more of your outlet and your respite, relatively speaking, the majority of your job, it's management, it's, it's scheduling, it's coordinating, it's return to play, it's psychology, it's nutrition, it's, it's grabbing luggage, it's doing all sorts of little jobs that you got to get it done. Like you're a roadie slash sports psychologist slash nutritionist slash almost assistant athletic trainer without the ability to do any hands-on work. We're, we're mm -hmm. facilitating, right? And I don't know if strength conditioning is more encompassing than performance coach or less encompassing, uh, but I do think there's a level of the, what that represents. And I think there's a, there's a got to, I'm going to get on a little bit of a rant here, but when we think about strength conditioning, I think it bears some sort of homage to our founding founding coaches, the the people that were trailblazers, so to speak, because we often lose sight about this. And I usually get on a tangent when we talk about principles, about the whole idea of reversibility is based off of someone having the courage to go to a sports coach or an athletic director saying, we need year-round strength conditioning. And that wasn't always a foregone conclusion. In fact, that was quite actually like a, a big ask. And it was, there was a lot of like, I am basically trying to create a whole new echelon of college, the college experience. It is, it is definitely in the, in the absolute like afterthought phase of it's just assumed that all teams will have a strength conditioning coach and will have access to facilities year round. There'll be some sort of check in in periods where they're not at the school or the the university there'll be in season management they'll be coordinating with sports medicine and, and sport coaches and administration but you know all that was off a simple premise that someone a long time ago and a collection of folks actually were capable of showing the value of this and, and it proved on the field and it proved on the court like people that were early adopters of strength conditioning were way out of the curve and dominated for a period of time. And then that, that playing field leveled and became more of a mainstay. But you know, the truth is when we talk about what is a strength coach, I think it's in the classic line. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. It is, it's a very simple thing to break down. There is an association with that, maybe even like a typecast or a stereotype. Uh, and you know, I think you can lead in hard to that stereotype. I don't necessarily think the the brand is as, bad as it once was or what it wasn't as like perceived negative right the you know you basically got a beer belly and and uh, yeah. a Fu Manchu and just running 110s and benching I think there's a little bit less of that sticker shock and negative bias but there's another element too of you know there's there's a lot of you know sports scientists and functional strength conditioning coaches and more of this like just outside the per the proverbial like definition of what a strength coach is. And I think it makes it a more well-rounded definition. And those, those coaches would be who to like classify themselves as strength coaches because, you know, deep down any sport coach, if you really ask them what they want, they want toughness, they want accountability. They want a team that understands that they're taken care of all throughout the off season. We're not babysitters, but the expectation is we're managing problems in off season period. So the coaches can focus on other things like recruiting or development in other areas. And when a coach has a person they trust, they're typically hands off. And I think a lot of that comes with the traditional associations where the strength coach is. But to answer your question directly, it's, 
a coach that focuses on physical development to enhance their ability to play their sport. And when we start to look at that as the definition, I think that gives us a lot of empowerment, but also gives us a very clear direction and vector to focus on. And one of the things that I pride myself on, and this is something I've recently had to do quite a bit and very extensively, is having a very clear descri- clear definition of what your roles and responsibilities are when you work with me. And that's how I evaluate you. And in order for you to get promoted or get more compensation or get more responsibility, you have to execute on these tasks. And a lot of it is centered off of that, what we call just being good in this one hour period, you know, from start to finish of a session and all the way through. And these are things that we want to get ahead on and describe of what is a good session versus a bad session. And it could be very simple as did everyone hit all their reps? And then we could extend it out to did everyone hit their reps to a certain level that we think is really, really going to be advantageous to their performance? And that could come in the form of position, range of motion, speed, external load. And then it could be extended on to the other variables of, okay, well, how much is this translating to performance? And that could become into development of qualities and having some sort of KPI or objective evaluation. Or it could just be going into the psychological aspect of, of how much do the athletes enjoy the experience and appreciate that and have a respect and, appreci- and understand why they're doing this. And I, as we start to break it down early on, it's very simple, binary, uh, yes, no. And then as we start to expand out, the expectation for more veteran seasoned coaches becomes a little bit more this gray, but also to this, we want to be, hey, you, you did the best job in that situation as possible, and that's going to have a second order consequence that's net positive, but first order, you had to manage it this way. And I, I think as we break it down in terms of like a strength conditioning coach, you know, it's that simple thing of on a rep basis what is your reputation to get people doing something at a high level and then over a set a training session a microcycle mesocycle macro cycle what is your ability and you could look at as fractals or simple rules repeating or we could just simply looking at it when Corey Hobbs is coaching a team in strength conditioning and that team is net better than not having him or I may be having someone else and that part to me is the foundation of what a strength conditioning coach really is it's someone that enhances, someone that provides something to that team, that athletic department that is a benefit. And that comes back to the the absolute like genesis of our profession in the beginning is you had to prove your worth every single day because no one was going to give you the time of day or the benefit of doubt or we don't have a lot of existing information to say this is going to be really beneficial for us, right? There's actually probably a lot more negative associations with it. So you had to you had to go out there and earn it. And sometimes it's this tangible thing of like, damn, these guys are working hard or wow, the the kids are really buying into this. They feel faster. They feel stronger. They feel more resilient. They believe they're getting ahead. And then the other part is the outcome, like get on the field, get on the court. Is your team more physically prepared than the other team? And how does that play out in terms of performance? And a lot of times it was, we're faster, we're stronger, we're more physical, we're better conditioned in the fourth quarter. All these things started to just come out. And, you know, that part, it could be anecdotal could be subjective but even the placebo effect is impactful but that's my definition of a strength conditioning coach is someone that enhances performance for a team or an individual and that could mean a whole host of things but your value is beneficial to that athlete's performance and maybe even resiliency i think that leads uh, nicely into my next question i want to ask is a lot of times i'll tell people what i do and they'll be like oh so you're a personal trainer and depending yeah. On my mood, I may or may not get into that. Just like, yeah, whatever, I'm a personal trainer. But so what is the difference between a strength coach versus a personal trainer? Well, I think that ties into the, I mean, even when I opened up my facilities seven years ago, I I was one of 132 people in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there was 132 head strength conditioning coaches football in the entire world at the college level. It's a pretty, very high percentile company. And open up a gym there was still that, you know, okay, well, what does that mean? What was that relatively right. speaking to the trainer down the road? Which, you know, like, I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great exercise in humility and your values, not necessarily what you've done, but what you can do, uh, which, you know, I would say this, if you're, if you want me to like clearly define a personal trainer versus a strength conditioning coach, it's, you know, from the actual mechanics and nuts and bolts of what we do, you know, we're prescribing exercises, we're adding some variables to it. 
and we're motivating clients or so, you know, from a very like, Hey, let's explain this to a Martian or a two year old, what we do. There's probably not a lot of difference, right. but on the other end of it, it's the, it's the association with it. It's the, the, I want to be in a very high stakes cutthroat experience with a team sector and, you know, comes with a lot of politics and a lot of being very territorial or being very competitive or assertive and commanding a room of 18 to 22 year olds or trying to be a presence or being a positive influence on a bunch of 13 to 18 year olds or I'm working with a bunch of professional athletes and I'm either trying to give them an edge or just manage this and hopefully getting them through a period of time where it makes them the most money they can possibly make in this window of, thing, window of opportunity they have till they retire and then they all of a sudden have to figure out how to squeeze that money as long as humanly possible or find another job. And these are all different value props in the team sector that aren't necessarily universal. And a personal trainer is just trying to get that person to come back, get them buy another package. So there is some carryover in terms of we all have some skin in the game and obligation to do a good job. But I think the notion of a strength conditioning coach working in the team sector or a personal trainer really comes into this very, very definitive, and it's only, it's, it's within the group but it's a definitive notion of what it takes to become a strength condition coach in the team sector, how hard it is, how many people are jockeying for the same positions, how little compensation there actually really is for a long period of time, if forever. And then comparing that to a personal trainer, like, you know, they, if they're personable, charismatic, they can probably make a lot more headway faster, at least monetarily or performance wise than a college strength coach uh, who has to go through the long, hard road. But, you know, when you break it down between the two, I think it just comes down to the the notion of where we're governed and we're motivated and incentivized by different things where I'm trying not to get fired in the team sector or I'm trying to enhance my athlete's experience as much as humanly possible versus a one-on-one. It's okay, this person put a lot of trust and respect to me and I do have an obligation and actually a strong desire to do that. Just not as much a sense of urgency or pressure. And I'm not saying that we don't have personal trainers that work really hard. Right. But the one thing I would say is as I've been in both sectors, the sense of urgency or just a constant fear or the, the constant pressure is a lot different in the private sector. Uh, and a personal trainer, you know, I think for the most part, everyone's doing their part and working hard and trying to get, an edge on the competition and provide as much value as possible. But the intensity in a team sector strength conditioning coach in their desire to improve or their desire to keep their job because of the sunk cost, you know, doing countless internships and traveling around the country and missing weddings and funerals and all the things that go into beginning in the team sector comes a certain level of things that are really hard to quantify to a personal trainer who got a job out of maybe high school or college and was really jacked and started getting clients right away. And they all loved, loved him or her. And they were able to make six figures in a couple of years. And it's like, Oh, what's so hard about that? Like, why is this such a big deal? And, and they have value, right? They're not saying that they're less than it's just, you know, the person that did three or four internships to make $32,000 a year plus has a master's degree probably has a different perception of what their job is, relatively speaking to a personal trainer that, yeah, I'm just doing this till I can get, you know, my break in acting or I'm just, you know, just trying to make money through college and I'm going to come go get a real job. I, I think there's that like just, I don't know, professional or career aspect of it. You know, the the burnout effect for both is probably equal, but the the willingness to quit is probably a lot less for a person that sunk a lot more time and effort and energy and probably money into becoming a strength coach as opposed to the personal trainer. Like, yeah, you know, easy come, easy go. Like I've reached my plateau point. I'm not excited to work anymore. I'll just do something else. Uh, I think that perception of it. So, you know, the, the way I could describe that, you know, I'm not really answering your question. I'm realizing as I'm talking, cause it's not an easy answer. And yeah. you know, it's, and it's something I still struggle with today. And you're right. Like the, is it just easier to agree? You yeah. know, and, You know, and sometimes I try to create, like, imagine a personal trainer working with 30 people at one time, Mm -hmm. you know, like that kind of context. I'm like, oh, so you're a phys ed teacher. Like, (laughs) okay. You know, I guess you could say, yes, I'm a physical, physical education teacher that is work as a a season. And if we don't do well in that season, I get fired, you know, (laughs) like, you know, just imagine that. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, as big as we've grown and as much as we are and the compensation, some of our top performing strength coaches are making 
it's still not a very easy thing to articulate and understand. It's more of a of familiarity is just not there and it's easy, harder and harder to find. And you even ask like athletic directors, like majority of them have very poor understanding of what we do and why we're there. We're just, they just got kind of strong armed by their sport coaches. of like, we need them. And here we are. It's interesting. You actually mentioned that on phys ed teachers. Cause on paper, that's what I am. We're just a PE teacher. And then in the district, they're like, Oh, you just teach PE. Like, okay. Well come to one of my classes and mm -hmm. then go watch one of the PE classes. And you tell me what the difference is. Cause yeah. you know, a lot of times they, there just isn't that level of understanding. So a lot of times you don't know it till you see it. Yeah. So, you know, just having conversations, just education, I think helps a lot. Absolutely. And so obviously I'm at a high school setting. You were uh, head one of 100 and I forget the number off the top of my head, 135 head strength coaches in football at a, an elite college setting. So there are a bunch, of, a bunch of different settings. Can you sort of take us through the different settings, what the advantages are, maybe disadvantages um, yeah. from your experience and your point of view? Yeah. So that gets into this what, right? Well, like, what do you want to do? And, you know, like, I think for the most part, you graduate high school, you go to college, you have a general idea of what you kind of want to get out of that four-year experience, and hopefully it puts you in a position to make money or do something of meaning and purpose or do something you can resonate with, like the, the old adage of find something you love and you never work a day in your life. Like These are all the 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 hopes and the intentions for going for secondary education and getting a degree in something. And I, everyone who goes through college, you know, that you kind of lose sight of that. Like it's the can't see the trees through the forest kind of mentality when you're in college and then you get out of college and then it goes, okay, go get a job, start paying back your student debt or your student loans. And then it starts to go, well, where do I find myself wanting to be? And it goes into a lot of criteria, right? And for the team, for the strength conditioning coaches, there's the team sector, private sector. Sometimes team sector is referred to as public, right? So we have that avenue. So I can work in the team sector, working for a high school, college, a professional team, doing that. And then there's the private. I can actually do team training in the private sector, or I can work one-on-one -on -one or small group. I can do a whole host of stuff in that area, right? But the difference is, okay, I'm working for an institution, organization, or university in the, the public sector or the, the team sector, as I like to classify it. And then you're working for a private organization that is doing it for profit and they're, they're looking at, it. and I think it gets in all these different dynamics, right? So, and I've been on both ends in terms of hiring and trying to motivate someone to come work for me, right? So in the public sector, the, the organization, the university, the high school, the team sector, you know, those are, okay, well, these are the best. Like, this is the best in the industry. At least that's what I'm telling people, right? This is the people that have the longest road to becoming in the profession. These are the ones that are, we have a filtration system that just squeezes out the best. And if you get past this threshold of interning, ga 10-month position, taking low-level assistant positions, what will come out is a diamond, right? You'll be top in your class in what you do. There's no doubt about it. Right, you went through the rigors of just becoming this hardened, really, really dedicated, capable, competent professional that few would ever really cl come close to. Right, you just basically went to Brazil, went to the beach, and you started just doing jujitsu with random people, not knowing a damn thing about it. Versus the private sector, it's okay. Yeah, you got to be competent, you got to be capable, and you got to be really good at what you do, but it gets into a different value prop of like the way you make money in that sector is you got to be able to sell. You got to be able to market. You got to be able to, to have the courage to walk up to someone saying, I think you should upgrade and move on to personal training with me. And, or I think you should sign up with my gym. And then it gets into a whole nother thing of like, okay, I got a little bit more entrepreneurial spirit in me. I like to I like to sell what I'm doing because I value what I'm doing. I think it could bring a tremendous insight to that. And I think it's a mindset and I think it's okay. I got to be as good as I need to be but then I need to be even better with selling and marketing what I do. And, and I'm not trying to downplay that their knowledge or their ability is lessened. It's just their value is tied into what they can actually convince someone else to buy versus in the team in the public sector. It's, they're going to be there, right? There's going to be a group of athletes in front of you at some point, and you now have to win them over over time, but there's not like much of a debate about it. Like, I got to see you Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and at 6 a.m., and we're going to go through this lift, 
and I could be good or bad at my job. It doesn't make a difference. You're going to be here anyway. You might not keep your job, but the truth is that as an athlete's got to show up. Versus in the public sector, I'm sorry, the private sector, if you're not very good at your job, there's a gym across the street that they can just go over to and say, I would just rather pay my hard-earned money over here. And I think it creates this mindset difference off of that. So as you're looking through this what, you know, there's a dynamic of, okay, like I love the idea of the journey and the path. And, and I'll, I'll tell you all the, the benefits of being in the public, in the public sector is it's intensity. It's pure like volume or time spent. You're on an Island with a group of strength coaches and you're in a weight room, you're pulling these incredibly long hours and, you're not going anywhere because you're afraid of losing your job, but it creates a bond that's hard. And I've been to so many weddings and I've been been to so many different great experiences and I have this intensity bond with strength coaches I've worked with that is far beyond anything else I can imagine. And then you tie it into this, you know, public sector. It's like, okay, or private sector, I'm sorry, I'm confusing those two, but the private sector, it's like, all right, I, I got to prove myself. I got to earn it becomes a little bit more transactional. I don't have as much of a con connection to the people I'm working with. I do have a strong connection with them because it's kind of in my DNA. But, you know, I think as a most, like the most part, if you go into any commercial gym that focuses on personal training, I wouldn't say most of those personal trainers are lifelong friends and they're going to be this. As soon as someone leaves, it's like, all right, out of sight, out of mind. I forgot him. I got to move on to my next client. And I think there's a lot of things behind that. So if you're looking through this, like what? I think you got to do an inventory of who you are, what you value, what you want to be, why, what, what is important to you. You know, where do you feel like you can make the biggest difference? If you're like, I, I really career centric and I really want to challenge myself and want to push myself, then yeah, the public team sector is probably your your best way to go. You know, and I think that part is for me at that point in my life when I was in the tw my twenties out of college, I wanted to do that. I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be thrust into this this lion's den of strength coaches and team sector and say, I can do this. And I put a lot of pressure on myself to do it. And I love that. I love that. I love that feeling that you get when you do something that's really hard that other people probably go, what's the point of this? You're making $32,000 a year living in Atlanta, working 80 hour weeks and always in the threat of getting being fired and not having a lot of really good job satisfaction to begin with, like working with a lot of challenging sport coaches and not having a great rapport with, you know, certain aspects of that job that quite frankly, probably wasn't worth it in the end. But the other end of it was like I, the intensity and the bond I have with the strength coaches I work with, you know, best man at the wedding with a guy who was probably hardest on me as an intern there. That was, I, I will never be able to replace that. And, you know, that part was exceptional. It's not like I was looking for friends. I just, I found my tribe and I found the people that I want to be with and I really want to spend my time with. But then as I opened up my own gym, like the connection to my clients, you know, I think I had a strong connection with my athletes, but, you know, I'm always floored and honored when someone's willing to pay me their hard earned money and give me their time and attention that sometimes I don't feel like it's like I'm deserving of it. But then again, too, I feel like, okay, well, I'm really good at what I do and I'm smart and I'm consistent and I'm also you know, probably attentive to other people's needs. As I know, I give off this impression that I'm not, but I definitely am. And I find that element too of like, I've evolved so much. So when I look at like this career arc or this trajectory, one, you're not locked into that, that forever, right? You can, you can probably go from one to the next, probably easier to go from the team sector to the private sector because the team sector is a young person's game and the sacrifice to get in there is contingent upon, do you have enough money or can you live in like a very Spartan-esque lifestyle? Are you willing to move? Are you willing to relocate? Do you have a family? You know, all of those things are variables that behoove those guys and women on the other end in the private sector. Okay. Well, I could do that in a, I can pick a geographically where I want to be because there's always a gym. There's always people willing to pay for training and then I can, you know, work on other skills. So I'd say the, the vector probably team sector, then private sector. But the other note, it's, you know, like I envy the folks who get in the private sector early and figure out what they want and, you know, have homes and are married with kids and have a good work-life balance and have an appreciation and love for what they're doing. And, have a little bit more entrepreneurialness and have a little bit more just being, I guess, better about protecting boundaries and that level. But, you know, the, the notion of this, it's, I think you got to start with, you know, that where do you find yourself like in 10 years that you'll still be happy? And it's a hard question to ask, but early on, if like I look at the investment of time over the course of my like career arc, where I find I'm going to be most fulfilled and happiest, I think it gives you a start to what vector you should be going towards. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great point. If you if you ask me five years ago if I would be in a high school setting, I probably would have told you you're crazy. But here I am. So you know, we we grow and evolve as coaches as well. What about you know niching or like those gurus type of situations? Yeah. So I think everything now is evolving into specialist, and and I think it's good in a lot of ways, right? I think you're creating a certain niche within a at one point was considered a niche in itself right. to bring value to an athletic department. Now there's, there's twofold to that one, that the more specialized you are in, you, you are the, the more value you could potentially be to a, a department, but it also might be limiting to opportunities, right? So if I have an assistant strength coach position working at a college and I already have a sports science person and that's your niche, you've basically just ruled yourself out. Right. Uh, but I need someone who's a great, great on the floor coach, your sports scientist or your nutrition or your return to play or a physical therapist wants to get a strength conditioning. Like you, you've limited your opportunities, but when you're actually in that environment, whether that's something that you were very, had a lot of foresight on and I want to be a specialist in that area. And I'm going to, I'm going to get, bring that value there. Uh, and then you get in there, you become more indispensable. And I think that part is, is playing itself out quite a bit. I think it's following a lot of the westernized medicine model of, okay, we have a podiatrist, we have a neurologist, we have specialists, right? You see your primary care physician and they refer you out to the endocrinologist because something's wrong with your hormones. You know, that that is kind of following the same suit within a strength conditioning department, right? You have your CEO and the head strength coach. You now these are like power five, like a lot of revenue schools and they can kind of really, really divide and conquer. And then you have your sports scientist, your return to play, your nutrition your speed person, you're in the weight room person, your development person, you're just your your coach that does competitions, your coach that does really just working with the sport coaches and trying to have a a good sports physical preparation model tied into their general physical preparation preparation model. And you have a lot of dynamics that are unfolding and in, in niched out. And you know, I think it's I think it's I think it's I think it's evolved our profession quickly. Really I do. Before we all had to wear all these hats and be good at everything and you know you kinda like the the try to master everything, you end up master nothing kind of mentality. But I, I do miss those days of being this like competent because that's the value for me. It's I just joy opening up a book on nutrition or sports science or physical therapy or psychology or motivational science or management. And like I'm not trying to be like ADHD strength coach, but I, I think that's the part that was always valuable to me. It's just never ending learning and it's always fascinating and net positive. Like I can kind of justify so many different resources and make myself really well-rounded, more of a Renaissance coach and a necessity at one point, but now you can just zero in on something. And I think there's good to that. Like, right. Like your capacity of understanding for that, like very focused niche is way above whatever I could be. But the other note, it's like, you know, if I'm the, if I'm kind of the person trying to enter the field and I have a very limited skill set, but it's a very developed skill set. You know, maybe it's a one out of five chance I get that job and I just have to play this roulette game of hopefully my skill set parlays into that position that's open. So I might limit my opportunities there or on the other end of it, when I get into that situation, you know, a lot of it is breaking down walls and and your value might be too high, relatively speaking, to what that's, that organization or a team really wants, right? So you have the most high level understanding nutrition, sports science, return to play, but yet that sport coach doesn't care about any of those or that head strength coach is like, I'm still going to do, you know, front squat, back squat, you know, like that, you know, squat, clean bench, like it's cool. Great. Right? Thank you for mentioning RSIs are down. Still going to yeah. do my same five by five program or, oh man, we have a lot of ACL sweet. Let's still, let's still do, let's still do sled push, sled sprints and, and just up downs. Cause that's the best way to condition, you know, like it's, it, it, it could come at like actual disadvantage and then you become maybe disenfranchised from that notion of that or frustrated the fact that you have underutilized talents. And then it gets into the, you got to be able to market yourself. You got to be able to sell yourself. You got to have to win friends and influence people. You got to get small wins. You got to prove value over time because they're just not going to accept that you're a genius in that area and say, oh, wow, let's just stop whatever we've been doing and just do what you say to do. Like there's a, there's another component of that. And I think that creates this almost like an engineer's type of thing. And I've been reading a lot of like how man people manage engineers or coders. And that's an interesting space to be in because I find it's very, very 
uh, in parallel with what we're dealing with strength conditioning coaches as now someone who's encouraging my staff to become very competent or just follow their interest and just ride in that. And hopefully that's rising tides, raise all boats phenomenon. Uh, it helps us overall, but the other note, it's like, you know, like I find there's another element of, we got to manage these incredibly strong skill sets in certain areas. So there's another end of this spectrum, but from an entry level point, like, you know, you're kind of playing a roulette game, but you're also, maybe you're making yourself that much more valuable. Like if it's undeniable that you're the best candidate because you're the most competent in that area, then yeah, it's a lot easier to get that job. But the only, the preface to that is if that job is open based off your skill set. And I think that's, it's kind of a, that's kind of like a, a game here, but it's also the, I mean, this is not a new phenomenon. I'm sure you've getting peppered with like ads of, you know, like the, Hey, there's a recession and unemployment's at all time high. The most coveted jobs in the next 10 years will be nurse or a, right. a coder or programmer or, you know, HR or something of that nature It's like, there's always this like, you know, pendulum swing of, okay, these, this is the next phase of job openings that we'll have. So if you want to get into the team sector, you got to be sports science. You got to be nutrition. You got to be return to play. You got to be speed. You got to be this. Then are this huge rush of people going in that direction. And all of a sudden now that becomes overloaded and it becomes maybe a, a seller's market as opposed to a buyer's market and, and getting people hired up. And I think that part is there. And then it gets in this other aspect of, well, shoot, if the only way I'm going to get a job is if I just differentiate myself from the pack and I build my own personal brand and become a speed guru or a sports science guru and I build my social media presence and then I'll get in that way. And then just like, well, you know, like your, your value there is probably different than what I could pay you. Like I was going to pay you 55 K a year and you have 300,000 followers and you could probably make that off just endorsements from that alone. It's like, all right, well, yeah, that's great. Like, <laughs> I don't care. You know, I'd rather get someone who has less followers and I can still pay 55 K a year. You know, I think there's really always like, it's a lot of now second order stuff, but it's interesting to watch this thing unpack and the niches that have evolved. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome, Tim. We've shown some of the, some of the great things in SNC, but also like, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And I think it's important to sort of hash that out for sure. So thank you. This has been super. Yeah. Appreciate it, Corey. All right. Well, we're talking about why next week. That's a fun one. I yeah. love that one. That's a good one. Awesome. All right, brother. I'll see you then.